Welcome uh, to this Alma Santa webinar on the topic of UAV Army, a global threat. It's great to have everybody here, the uh, distinguished panelists and the viewers. First of all, I'd like to thank the Council for Secure America for co-sponsoring this uh, important event. And uh, let me just begin with a few words about the Alma Center. For those of you who are not familiar with the Alma Center's work, uh, this is an independent nonpartisan research and education center that focuses on Israel's security challenges along the northern borders. Um, Alma sees it as a personal mission to provide research and analysis of the geopolitical reality and the developments regarding Israeli security challenges on its northern border. Now, the Alma Center is situated in Israel's northern Galilee. It's only six miles from the border with Lebanon. And it, uh, the Alma team encounters uh, these security challenges that it speaks about um, in, in their day-to-day -day lives. The center provides unique, high-quality research on developments in Lebanon and Syria and their effects on Israel's security, mainly Hezbollah in Lebanon and the Iranian development of proxies and their attempt to build a second Hezbollah in Syria. Now, when it comes to discussing the UAV global threat, it's important to note um, that this threat has gone from a tactical issue to a strategic one. It seems that many nations are only now waking up to the scope of damage that this once tactical weapon system can cause potentially. Um, the net effect when it's taken into account um, changes the picture and, and it, it appears as if this realization is, is taking place worldwide. Uh, UAV swarms can destroy radars of air defense systems. They can blind a country's ability to defend itself against air attack and they can hit strategic sites with great precision. Um, they're low flying, some of them are slow, they can be evasive, they can be used to terrorize cities, they can be used to hit energy sites, uh, hit moving maritime targets as Iran has recently demonstrated um, this past summer. So Iran's growing use of its UAVs are clues, red flags if you like, or dots that need to be connected uh, to see where this threat is headed. And joining me to discuss um, how these dots can be connected is a panel of distinguished experts. I'll introduce all of them and then we'll enter into an interactive discussion. And I'd like to uh, tell the panelists and encourage them um, to go ahead and respond to points that you hear during the conversation. If you feel compelled to do so, um, you're absolutely encouraged to do so. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel a Reserve Sarit Zahabi is the CEO and founder of ALMA. Um, she is in the IDF Reserves and she has served for 15 years in, his, in the Israeli military, specializing in military intelligence. Sarit has briefed hundreds of groups and forums ranging from U.S. senators, congressmen and women, and politicians, senior journalists, visiting VIP groups in Israel and overseas. Uh, Sarit had, uh, scripts numerous position papers and updates uh, focus uh, groups on Lebanon, Syria, and Israel's national security challenges. Um, as I've said, she has served for 15 years uh, in the IDF, and she holds an MA uh, in the um, Middle East Studies from Ben Gurion University, um, and uh, she is the CEO of ALMA. Uh, Tal Inbar is a senior research fellow at the Missile Defense Advocacy Alliance. Uh, Tal began working for the Fisher Institute for Air and Space Strategic Studies here in Israel in 2003, and he became the director of the Institute's Space and UAV Research Center in 2007, uh, serving in that position until the closing of the Institute in 2019. He co-founded the International Elon Ramon Space Conference in 2006, and he's a leading member of its academic uh, committee and has been ever since. Uh, Tal is also co-founder of the Israeli Space Society, an NGO whose main objective is to promote the space activities here in Israel. And he's a member of uh, several scientific organizations such as the Space Studies Institute, the National Space Society and the Planetary Society, um, and the Israeli Astronomy Association, as well as the Israeli Nano Satellites Association. Um, and under his supervision and guidance, the Fisher Institute conducted major research into I Israel's space policy, uh, which led to a presentation to the Israeli Parliamentary Committee on Science and Technology and to a presidential committee. Uh, Sess Franzman is the author of a recent book, Drone Wars, Pioneering uh, Killing Machines, Artificial Intelligence, and the Battle for the Future. This is a book that's been described by uh, General David Petraeus, the former commander of U.S. Central Command, which is responsible for the Middle East, and the former director of the CIA, as a riveting account of one of the most significant developments in contemporary warfare. Um, Seth covers Middle East security and defense issues for the Jerusalem Post, um, and Israeli defense developments for Defense News. 
Um, he's originally from Maine. He has a PhD from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He's been a guest lecturer at the Hebrew University, at Bar Ilan University. He has lectured for years at Al Quds University uh, in American Studies as an assistant professor. And he's been a research uh, associate at the Rubin Center for Research and International Affairs at IDC Herzliya. And Seth has provided in-depth coverage of uh, all of Israel's armed conflicts in recent years. And he's also written extensively on Kurdish issues. Um, so I'd like to begin with you, Sarit, and I'd like to um, begin with a relatively simple question, but one that leads us to complex affairs. You uh, recently released a report that made headlines um, around the world. And, and the question I'd like to ask you based on this report is, how many UAVs does Hezbollah possess? And should we be surprised by the number that you're going to give us? Well, it depends who you ask. Uh, OK, so yes, we published a report, an in-depth report about the UAV army of Hezbollah. Uh, really around 50 pages that uh, described where it is, um, the different types, what's the logic behind it, and eventually we received tons of questions about the amount in the hands of Hezbollah, though I think it's not their story. Uh, and everybody were asking, how did you evaluate that Hezbollah is holding uh, 2,000 uh, UAVs? Um, so, well, actually, when you look at the timeline, and we'll try to share, uh, let me know if you can see this. Uh, yep. Understand that um, if Hezbollah had 200 UAV in 2006, uh, in 2013, and around 50 in 2006, meaning that it succeeded to four times increase the amount of UAVs in its hands in uh, only a few years. And mm -hmm. then afterwards, we have seen more reports in 2016 that the amount is continuing to grow. We understand that uh, to evaluate that uh, today in the hands of Hezbollah 2000 is not an imaginary number. Moreover, when we look at the array, the arsenal of the UAVs in the hands of Hezbollah and in the hands of the other proxies in the Middle East, when we look at the importance that the Iranians uh, see to this project uh, in Iran and elsewhere, uh, we mm -hmm. understand that uh, this is something that it's not just, uh, you know, an ammunition that it's tactic. As you said, uh, also in the eyes of the Iranians themselves, this is a, a battle, you know, uh, a product that enables them to do something that they were not capable of doing before because it's, mm -hmm. the UAVs are much more accurate. They can get to longer distances, uh, up to mm -hmm. thousands of miles. Um, and again, and very accurate, and it can, you know, be a complementary capability uh, for the rockets, and of course for the fact that they are, uh, their inferiority when we speak about the air force and the Israeli capability in this respect. Right. Right. Um, moreover, the 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 industry of UNVs and drones greatly developed in the last uh, decade. It's not what it used mm -hmm. to be a decade ago or 15 years ago. And of course, uh, Iran is part of that. Uh, and in the past few months, we have seen that Iran used these uh, UAVs uh, in many places uh, around the Middle East. And we understand that, uh, that Hezbollah, which is the ace of, Hezbollah, of Iran, the, the proxy of Iran, the most professional proxy of Iran, the most loyal mm -hmm. one, the biggest one, of course, it will equip it with an arsenal uh, of UAVs. By the way, the Iranians also provided uh, Hezbollah uh, selfie manufacturing capabilities. So uh, it's right. UAVs manufactured in Iran and it's UAVs that are being manufactured by Hezbollah itself. And the uh, products or the UAV themselves are being brought uh, either by land or by air, uh, which is clear that the fact that the Iranians are much more involved now uh, in Syria and in Iraq, and they open what we call the ground corridor that enables them to, uh, to bring all of that uh, all the way from Tehran to Beirut, um, makes it much more easier for them to equip Hezbollah with the ammunition that is you know, in large scale mm -hmm. uh, compared to what you, we, we, you, we used to see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you uh, very much for that, Zarid. I think that's an excellent um, beginning. 
uh, introduction to our topic, 2,000 um, UAVs in the possession of Hezbollah, recognition by the Iranian access that this is uh, the weapon to get hold of going forward and a complementary capability to their offensive rocket capability. And uh, Seth, I'd like to come to you now. And before I, I, I ask you a question about uh, this critical issue of UAVs, can you talk to us a little bit about your remarkable book, um, what drove you to write it, and what did you discover um, in your exploration of this issue as you researched it? Well, sure. Thank you so much for for having me today. It's a it's a very important issue, and I'm glad to see that the you know UAVs and especially the Iranian drone program is is starting to get a lot more attention because it's certainly a program we're seeing that is a major threat to the region and is, and is kind of exponentially growing in a way. And Iran is certainly putting a lot of spotlight on this. In terms of the, the book that I wrote, the last book I was writing was a book about the war against ISIS. And I spent a lot of time on the front line, especially in Iraq, especially with Kurdish Peshmerga in Northern Iraq, covering the war mm -hmm. against ISIS. And at the very end of the conflict, when the Iraqi uh, army and federal police were going into Mosul and clearing ISIS street by street in this kind of, I think, eight month battle to retake this major city. I spent mm -hmm. some time there and I remember being with the Iraqi federal police and soldiers and the one thing that spooked them out because they had a huge number of men under their command. They had like 50,000 men against really very few ISIS fighters. But what really scared them was the fact that they knew that ISIS had drones and ISIS was able to rig a lot of drones during that conflict and they were using them not only to carry out a bit of surveillance but also to drop uh, munitions mm. onto armored vehicles and onto troops so it was something that was strange because here you have the iraqi army you have an 80 or 70 80 country coalition ostensibly supporting this massive operation so more countries ever combined in the world history trying to just defeat this one terrorist group and yet with all that all those resources somehow they didn't have air defense against this drone threat. There were nothing that these guys on the ground could do to stop the drones. And they didn't, they couldn't have a way to detect them. So if they heard a buzzing noise, you know, they just they just assumed, well, that must be an ISIS drone. It could be one of their own drones. So I, I was amazing to see this kind of chaos. And I think that that piqued my interest a bit. And then when I was doing more reporting especially in Israel on defense technology and realizing that like one out of every three or four stories had to do with something that was related to autonomous weapons or unmanned systems. So not just drones, you know, but also communications, uh, the digital army, you know, also unmanned vehicles, unmanned uh, vessels at sea. The whole nature of, of basically taking soldiers out of all these platforms and having the platforms do all sorts of things, scan buildings, you know, give drone swarms, whatever it is. And also the fact that you need to be able to use radar and air defenses to detect these threats more and more. And I started to see the degree to which, you know, Israel, which is obviously at the cutting edge, a really super high tech country, startup nation, et cetera, et cetera. Also, Israel is a very nimble country in terms of procurement and putting new technology on the battlefield. I just noticed how much, you know, this was a kind of undiscovered country. It's not that no one had ever written about drones before. There are books about the predator drones and things like that. There's a book called Wire right. for the War. It was just mm -hmm. that I felt I wanted to I wanted to read a book about the global arms race for drones, and the book didn't exist. So I felt like okay, right. I have right. an opportunity here to go write it. It's very interesting that um, that one of the things that sparked uh, your motivation to write this was your exposure to the to the pioneering use of drones mm -hmm. by the Sunni jihadists of ISIS. Um, and they were really uh, one of the first to use this weapon so effectively on the battlefields of the Middle East. And, and now I'd like to ask you about the Shiite radicals in Iran um, and why did they decide to adopt UAV capabilities so early on in the 1980s? Well, it's interesting. So Iran was a pioneer in drone warfare early on at the same period that you know, Israel was also pioneering drones um, to defeat the Syrians in, in Lebanon. And Israel had been tinkering around with drones, you know, since the late 70s and, and had really come into its own in the 80s with drones. And I think the United States, of course, as well as the country was beginning to tinker around with them well. But there were a lot of programs out there that didn't really work. What's interesting about the Iranians is here you have a country that after the Islamic Revolution is in a bit of a chaos. And then all of a sudden it's, it's plunged into this massive, vicious war against Iraq. And Iraq at the time was a very wealthy country with a pretty competent army. And it was, they were using uh, chemical weapons. You know, this was a devastating war for Iran. 
and around, you know, was sending child soldiers to the front line, you know, uh, human wave attacks. It was a total disaster for the country. And they also had a huge attrition rate in terms of the pilots because, because mm -hmm. of the revolution, a lot of the loyal pilots that were related to the Shah's regime, some of them had left. Iran didn't have new parts for all their aircraft because they were flying American aircraft. And so they hit upon the idea that, wait, you don't need to build new F-15s, which you're not going to be able to build anyway. But we have, I mean, if you're around, they had Bell Helicopter, they had a Bell Helicopter factory. They had some of the know-how to build certain things. And in the end of the day, a drone in those days, we're just talking about a large model plane, a remote, remote piloted vehicle, right? And the idea mm -hmm. the Iranians had, which the Israelis had thought up and others had thought up was, the cool thing about drones is you can put a camera on it. You can fly it over enemy positions. If it gets shot down, that's okay. There's no pilot in it. If it doesn't get shot down, it can come back and deliver you film, or in the case of Israel, it was using real-time video and things, but in the case of the Iranians, right. it was film. And all of a sudden, they had in their hands and their disposal something that gave them a kind of instant air force, in a sense, of surveillance against an Iraqi army that I think was probably you know, superior to them in many ways in terms of its... Mm -hmm. uh, its sophistication and, and all sorts of things. So mm -hmm, the Iranians mm -hmm. created several types of drones in the 1980s, uh, two big, two, which became kind of families in a sense, the, the Muhajir and the Ababa and later on the Shahids. These are all kind of think of them as an evolutionary trunk of a trunk of a tree, which now gave birth right. to a whole bunch of things. So right. it's fascinating. Right. They, they really, really pioneered that. Yeah. It sounds from your description that they were, very early uh, uh, in, in that game, in the development and the production of, of, of that because of their uh, brutal experience with Iraq. And Tal, I'd like to come to you now, um, and, and perhaps you can help us uh, correct a misperception, because a lot of people that I speak to, they still seem to think that UAVs are some sort of, you know, um, uh, and I'm talking about UAVs in the hands of, of, of adversaries, of, of radical actors. The, the, these are basically remote control toys. You know, they can be ordered online. And, and this is sort of the association that they have when, when they hear about this, these capabilities. Um, are they wrong? And, and if so, can you, can you explain to us why they're wrong? Uh, sure. Uh, first, I think uh, they are wrong, uh, but it depends on the, who, who the adversary is. So if we, we are speaking about, uh, let's say, a very small terrorist group that uh, are relying on the online buying of uh, off-the-shelf technologies like uh, Chinese-made uh, small quadcopters, like something like this, well, this is an improvised uh, weapon. By the way, it could be very effective, uh, as we saw just uh, recently, the um, assassination attempt on the Iraqi prime minister Actually, it was quite large uh, quadcopter, but it's not uh, military grade uh, equipment. And if mm -hmm. you are speaking about uh, larger terrorist groups like uh, Hamas, Islamic Jihad and Hezbollah, well, they can uh, afford themselves to get some uh, very good uh, equipment either from uh, directly from uh, uh, Iran or uh, if you uh, think about the, the Houthis in Yemen, uh, they have their own uh, capabilities of uh, using these uh, Iranian made or Iranian inspired, let's say, uh, uh, armed UAV or suicide uh, UAVs. Uh, mm -hmm. The new line of Iranian uh, vehicles uh, are relatively uh, sophisticated. They are quite like Western um, uh, equipment like uh, we are uh, used to see in, uh, in other countries. Uh, just recently, they unveiled the Gaza, uh, they named it Gaza during uh, Operation Guardian of the Walls. Uh, so uh, it is a very large uh, UAV uh, armed, uh, equipped with uh, uh, satellite communication, uh, more than 24 hours uh, endurance, a lot of uh, new um, items inside. So uh, yes, there is a very sophisticated um, drone industry and UAV industry uh, in Iran. Uh, let alone other countries. And uh, just recently, we saw some uh, evidence of uh, Iranian export of UAVs, not only to Yemen or uh, to other uh, proxies in the region, but also to, to Venezuela, uh, which is, uh, I think, uh, quite close to the continental United States. And we saw uh, mm -hmm. another uh, pop-up of uh, Iranian-made uh, drone system, including the... Uh, ground equipment uh, in uh, Ethiopia. So it's, it is a global issue. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you uh, very much for that, Tal. And, and Sari, Tal just mentioned Venezuela, and I know that that was an important part in the report that you just released. Um, you uh, reported there that uh, Iranian-made UAVs have traveled far beyond the Middle East and are now, as, as Tal just uh, mentioned, are in, in America's backyard, uh, 2,000 kilometers from Miami. What's the significance of that development? So first, Venezuela is part of what we call Shiite axis. So it's funny, but not all members of Shiite axis are actually Shiite, but they are probably part of this axis that is led by Iran and uh, allied uh, with Iran. Uh, the specific UAVs that were provided uh, to Venezuela uh, from, the name is Muajer 6. Uh, and by the way, Venezuela itself also, again, manufactures uh, UAVs based on these, uh, on these Iranian UAVs as quite impressive capabilities with regard to accuracy and flying to far distances of around uh, 2,000 kilometers, which is actually the distance to Miami, uh, fl can fly around uh, 12 hours. And though uh, due to Venezuela leadership, it's all about a security mission. Uh, it is clear that Venezuela and Iran can decide upon using these uh, drones in order to uh, put pressure on the United States to influence the United States policy in the Middle East uh, and maybe elsewhere, and even in some more uh, extreme scenarios uh, to revenge and to retaliate uh, United States uh, for uh, uh, operations that will be attributed to United States elsewhere. So of course it has uh, meanings that you have, um, that somebody which is an ally with Iran has these kind of UAVs that close to United States. Right. And do you think that this trend will continue? We'll see the proliferation of these Iranian, specifically these Iranian made systems beyond the borders of the Middle East, that this will no longer just be a regional issue? I, I believe so. Why not? First, it's a great income, which the Iranians need. Mm -hmm. And second, it creates a military alliances. So why not? Right. Right. Seth, after the Iranians um, locked on to the advantages that these systems provide them in the Iran-Iraq war, um, they ran forward with what appears to be all of their um, focus and resources and continue to develop these right up until the present day. Can you um, talk us through some of the uh, capabilities that they're developing today and what advantages they see uh, in today's battlefield conditions and in their strategic situation that causes them to continue to cling and develop and produce in such large numbers uh, UAVs in, to this day and age? Well, my sense is, as we've kind of heard here, you know, Iran has, let's say, a kind of cake-like foreign policy in terms of the, Iran, uh, the drone concept. One is that Iran, as I said, wanted to have an instant air force. It, it, it latched onto the fact that it's under sanctions. It can't build sophisticated fifth generation or fourth generation fighter planes or bombers or whatever. But it realized that it could build all sorts of interesting drones and also it could find ways to reverse engineer and steal the technology from others. So it downed a US uh, spy drone in 2011, a Sentinel, and then also was able to make a whole bunch of copies of it, also a bunch of copies of things that look like predator drones. And those are kind of interesting, but I think what Iran is starting to do, which you're seeing now a lot of is export this technology, especially these kamikaze drones all around the region. And when we start to think of the kamikaze drones, I think we need to think, you know, this is not exactly a drone in the traditional sense. This is kind of like a cruise missile or what's called a, a loitering munition or, or what have you. It's a, it's, a, it's a tube, it has a munition in it. It can fly to a destination, you pre-program mm -hmm. it. You're not necessarily in the loop while it's going there. So you can, it's good, you can, you can send it to proxies because the proxies don't have sophisticated operators to fly the things. So you mm -hmm. can unpack it, a kind of an idiot can use it. You tell it where to go, I guess. I think what we're seeing Iran try to do now is get to the next generation of that. So we saw the attack on the ship in the Gulf of Oman, which is was a kamikaze drone apparently, uh, several of them. One of them hit the bridge of the ship. Now, what that would tell me is, um, it's one thing to pre-program a coordinate somewhere, it's quite another to hit a moving object, it means you probably have to be able to have real time um, video and everything that's at this, you're actually operating it. So I think that mm -hmm. what we're seeing now is Iran trying to take all this to the next level and put all these pieces together. And I kind of said that it's like an evolutionary tree. They had a whole lot of things that they were building. If you see their military parades, it's an endless 
plethora menagerie of all these drones. It's a lot different, by the way, than if you look at like the United States military or something where, you know, they rely on just several major platforms mm -hmm. like Spreader or Reaper or whatever. Right. Iran built a huge number of them. I think they're now trying to say, okay, how do we pare this down to something that will work and also something that really can threaten our adversaries like the United States, Saudi Arabia, Israel, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Countries that are really sophisticated and wealthy but, you know, just one drone getting through all those air defenses and flying into a ship or a gas platform or a, an airport or what have you, you know, that's a that's a big problem. And I think Iran wants to put that threat on the board all the way from Yemen um, with a kind of three, three or four thousand mile ring of drone threats all the way to Lebanon. Well, wow, that's a, a dramatic picture to to conjure up when we look at it from that zooming out. Um, and one of the things I think that is uh, of great interest to defense decision makers across the entire Middle East, uh, from Israel to pragmatic Sunni countries, and of course, uh, to American forces in the region is, is the issue of defense and counter UAV uh, technological systems that are able to take on a threat. And I'd like to ask you, Tal, about some of those systems. What's available on the market? What do these capabilities look like? And, and how, in your view, do they match up to the threat? Are, are they good enough? Well, uh... We saw in 2019 the attack on the Aramco facilities in Saudi Arabia, for example, and there, there was actually no aerial defense in the region. The Saudis lack a sufficient number of radar detection systems and the deployment was not, not so, let's say, adequate to the real threat. They came from another, another direction. so. Um, as for uh, available uh, counter drone uh, capabilities, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, even commercial uh, systems, uh, starting with uh, jamming of uh, GNSS, uh, uh, like uh, uh, jamming uh, GPS, GLONASS, Galileo, and so on. Uh, electronic warfare, uh, for example, uh, can be used. Uh, from a short uh, range, uh, there is a mobile system that looks like a gun with antenna in, in, at the end. Uh, there are some uh, laser systems that can uh, shoot down uh, the drones, uh, but uh, we can see from a lot of examples that, uh, for example, for for just uh, for example, uh, uh, a civilian air, uh, airport is not uh, so well uh, protected and uh, several airports were shut down for a period of time because some it could be just a kid uh, flying around with uh, its uh, smaller quadcopter, but it could be a real threat. So uh, there is not a uh, sufficient, um, let's say, uh, a mechanism that uh, can, uh, can, can uh, complement one part of the other detection, uh, mitigation, prevention of uh, any any incoming drone uh, coming to uh, to attack and we saw for several uh, uh, we saw several examples uh, here in Israel that uh, we used uh, uh, sometime we, we could uh, use a, a helicopter like the Apache uh, in other cases it was an F16 uh, firing air to air missile this mm -hmm. uh, you can do on on a regular day, not uh, during an all-out war with a lot of uh, dozens of, um, uh, let's say, interceptors like Iron Dome and hundreds of incoming rockets from Gaza or from uh, another direction. So this you can do it uh, in a, a semi-sterile uh, environment. So in an all-out uh, war, several drones uh, definitely will uh, come through any, uh, any uh, uh, active defense uh, system. So, the, so is there, there is no system currently in place um, that could effectively protect against a, a swarm. Is is that correct? And a swarm is an, is another issue. You know, swarm swarm is a, is quite a, quite a threat. Uh, but you have to still remember that a swarm of uh, of UAVs are uh, relatively small. So the amount of uh, munition, uh, explosives, and so on uh, on board is uh, relatively small. Uh, okay. But uh, but you are correct. There is not a uh, uh, sufficient uh, solution to the problem yet. Okay, thank you for that. No um, one hundred percent. Sorry, sorry. Did you did you want to come in on that point? 
I just said that there is no uh, defense system, by the way, not only with the, the drones and UAVs, but also with regard to rockets, that it 100% provides 100% defense. Right, right. And um, so in terms of the past two to three years, um, the use of the Iranian access, um, excuse me, by the Iranian access of UAVs has, has clearly gone up in, in an acute manner. Are there any specific examples that you can point to, point our listeners to that really um, tell us um, where things are headed? Or have there been any prominent uses of these systems that really stand out to you in, in the past two to three years that you flag this and say, we really need to see how, how this has just been used because this is where, where the battlefield is headed? So actually, as said, described it, there are so many examples that it was not easy to choose. Uh, but I eventually, I wanted to focus on three examples uh, that's a little bit shaken, I think, the perception of what are the drones for the Iranians and what can they, what are their capabilities, what can they do? Uh, because as Seth said, at first it was just for patrol and intelligence gathering, and today it's completely different. So 2018, uh, by the way, if I'm telling that from a personal uh, point of view, 2018, it was Saturday morning, I woke up, I saw hundreds of messages on my WhatsApp, I understood that something was happening during the night. And then we understood that actually um, uh, IDF uh, intercepted an Iranian drone that penetrated uh, south to the Sea of Gali in Bechean Valley. Uh, a few weeks ago, our uh, defense minister exposed that this specific drone was carrying ammunition for the Palestinian Authority. Uh, this incident is interesting because it caused for a day of battle in the sky, meaning that Israel retaliated and the Syrians retaliated and uh, firing uh, anti-aircraft uh, uh, missiles and event. And we had alerts here in the Galilee because some of the debris of the anti-aircraft missiles fell in the Galilee and Israel uh, destroyed the, the launching uh, cabin of the drone in, in Syria, inside Syria, miles away. Uh, from Israel, and eventually the Syrians succeeded in uh, taking down an Israeli F-16, which is the first time it happened since the Yom Kippur. So, you know, it was just a small drone mm -hmm. that actually uh, uh, created an escalation, and it always reminds us uh, how vulnerable the situation here uh, on the northern border is. Mm -hmm. Another example mm -hmm. is from six, September 2019, and here, here I'm going outside of Israel, and I'm going to Saudi Arabia, and you mentioned that incident before, uh, of, we don't know exactly how many, maybe, maybe Tal or Seth have better information, but uh, we understand it was quite a few, okay, we don't know the exact number of drones that were launched, uh, probably from Iran, uh, towards Saudi Arabia, towards the oil uh, infrastructures of Saudi Arabia, along with also some uh, cruise missiles and rockets, and um, and this attack that was, though the Houthis took responsibility, claimed responsibility, we understand it happened from Iran, actually, uh, created so much damage that uh, it damaged the capability of Saudi Arabia to produce oil for a few days. And this, of course, uh, affected uh, the markets all over the world. Uh, last uh, October, a different incident in a different area, which is in Iraq, uh, on one of the border crossings between Iraq and Syria, where the Americans are present on the Syrian side of the border. And uh, again, it was a drone attack against the American base. Iranians wanted to send a message to the Americans saying that uh, any attack against Iranian assets in Syria, whether coming from Israelis or from Americans, will be met or could be met with retaliation also against Americans. Uh, nobody got hurt. Uh, the Americans uh, probably had uh, uh, previous information and they evacuated their soldiers uh, beforehand. But again, it uh, reflects the capability of Iran to send messages uh, by the drones, uh, by suicidal drones or kamikaze drones. Uh, only a few mm -hmm. days later, the Iranians used the drones also to interfere in internal issues of Iraq and trying to assassinate the Iraqi prime minister that uh, is trying to create different reality in Iraq and different reality of, in the foreign relations of Iraq, trying to bring over the Arab Gulf countries to be closer to Iraq. And the Iranians, again, wanted to send a message to uh, the Iranian prime minister or maybe even kill him. They failed. But I think the message was, the message was understood. And uh, the feeling is that, uh, again, that the Iranians are using the drones for 
uh, transferring ammunition, for sending for uh, sending messages to the Americans and threatening them, and for uh, interfering in internal issues of the countries in the region. And eventually, <laughs> seen few incidents of drones that crashed into um, uh, ships or containers in the Arab Gulf. Um, uh, trying again, it's just sending a message. It didn't actually create a huge uh, damage, but uh, the message is understood. In one of the incidents, there was also uh, casualties, um, and this can disrupt uh, economic relationship in the region uh, if this will become a daily reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and based on what you're saying, Sri, uh, I, I can conclude, at least from my part, that this is an extremely convenient and agile and flexible weapon for Iran because it allows it to do so many different things, um, from sending messages, from trying to take out um, figures that they don't like or threatening them, uh, transferring weapons to uh, terrorists in the West Bank. It's just so many different ways to use um, essentially the same kind of weapon system. So that seems to be a very convenient um, a new uh, a a avenue for, for the Iranian regime. Uh, would you agree with that? Yes, yet I want to stress what Talin Bao said, that uh, this new weapon, uh, though it creates a new battlefield in the 21th century, it is also a very valuable. And maybe it is even more valuable than the rockets we used to talk about. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, it's, yes, it's, it's very uh, flexible with the terms of the mission, but it is also mm -hmm. vulnerable with terms of how do you defend yourself from this, uh, from this kind of weapons. Right. That's a great point. Um, Seth, when, when we're looking at, um, you know, the Iranian regime and the funds that are available to it to continue to develop, manufacture, uh, do more research and development, um, we've got nuclear talks happening in Vienna. We've got the possibility of sanctions relief uh, heading uh, Iran's way. We don't know if that will happen, of course, but it's certainly on the table. Um, and in any case, it appears as if um, sanctions enforcement, the enforcement of the current sanctions uh, by the Biden administration has at least until recently been quite shaky. So if the Iranian regime is able to get access to far more funds, um, whether through sanctions relief or other, other developments, what would that do in your view to Iran's UAV capabilities going forward? Well, that's a good question, I think, because I think as, as Sarit pointed out and others, is that, you know, the drones, uh, the drones don't win wars, right? I mean, it's not a blitzkrieg of drones. And even, even the drone swarm or whatever that was used against Abkhaz, it didn't destroy Saudi Arabia. It set them back a bit. So the, the amazing thing about Iran is Iran is, has found this crazy, this technology that fits a kind of niche that is really great for what Iran wants to do, which is kind of plausible deniability, be able to ship them all over the region, terrorize people. Um, but you know, again, you don't um, you don't win a war with this with this thing by itself. So, let's say that the sanctions relief comes, and then Iran is flush with cash, right? I think if you're an Iranian IRGC commander, and all of a sudden you know you Haji Zeta or whoever, and you've got a whole bunch of money. Uh, mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, let's say you can import real technology, and then someone says, well, wait, you know, we can start buying actual aircraft now uh, from China or Russia or whoever, right? All of a sudden, they face with a real problem, which is that they invested a huge amount of resources in all this indigenous technology, which they're very, very proud of. And yet, in the end of the day, the indigenous technology, they're, they're definitely um, pioneering this. They deserve a bit of a Nobel Prize in terms of what they've done in terms of all these drone threats. But I think then having too much money will, allow, will give them a bit, of, um, a bit of a headache because they'll have to decide, OK, where do we take this next? You know, do we just need to do we just keep trafficking drones to places like Hezbollah? And, you know, Sarit said Hezbollah might, let's say they have 2,000 two, two drones. OK. Mm -hmm. How many drones can they possibly have if they had if the, if Iran wanted to give them more? They're going to have forty thousand drones. Where are they going to keep them all? I mean, in the end of the day, a drone has to fly from somewhere, right? If it's a big platform, where do you put them all? Eventually, you have too many, and you become vulnerable. Unless, of course, you know their idea is okay. We're going to build lots of small loitering munitions um, that can be uh, you know launched by let's say an individual person. Okay, mm -hmm. fine. There's all sorts of different technology out there, but I, I get the sense that there's a, you know, kind of a curve there where the drone threat goes up and up and up, 
But then there's a point at which, okay, if it becomes too much and too traditional, then it, it actually makes them vulnerable. And then you, and then it makes it so that you can see them with satellites. And if you want to go in and take them out, you can, and you can monitor where they're flying from and what they're doing with them. Uh, and mm -hmm. also perhaps being flush with cash, they don't have as much of a, let's say, drive or necessity, necessity to innovate as much. And so they become a bit, let's say, lazy. And I wonder if that's mm -hmm. actually a, a, a thing that they'll face if that happens. Yes, yeah, I think what you just described is exactly the process that happened to Hezbollah with regards to the rockets. It uh, became the rockets, the fact that they had so many rockets hidden in civilian areas created this balance, balance of deterrence that we are actually enjoying in the past 15 years. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting um, perspective in terms of how far this can go and what the glass ceiling is. And that leads me to a question that I'd like to um, put to Tal about something that um, I certainly find very interesting, which is the Iranian um, research and development process um, that goes into these things that and goes into developing so many different types, so many different types of <coughs> capabilities, all these things that are paraded, all these systems that we constantly see, you know, the names are sometimes overwhelming because there's so many different types of systems. So Tal, can you help us um, understand what the Iranian uh, R&D process looks like when it comes to developing uh, these systems? Um, actually, there is a, let's say, an internal conflict between, uh, let's say, uh, the Revolutionary uh, Guards, uh, the Army, the Navy, and so on. Uh, there are several industries, there are a lot of projects that are coming from uh, technological universities, if you will, uh, if you want to believe that uh, it is only civilian-oriented, uh, but actually they are backed by the uh, uh, by the government and by the military and the IRGC. So uh, there are some cases of um, uh, not so um, uh, regulated uh, system of decision making because you can see a lot of uh, duplications uh, between uh, several types uh, of the of the vehicles. But the most uh, advanced one are those are, that are going into use with the IRGC. Uh, like the Shahed uh, 129, which is uh, resemble, uh, resembling a lot uh, some uh, Israeli product uh, uh, that uh, we are all aware of, uh, and other uh, uh, sophisticated vehicles. Uh, so I cannot see any, let's say, one mastermind behind all the Iranian uh, UAV efforts. Yes. So th this is uh, leading to a uh, waste of money and time. Uh, but uh, mm -hmm. I am uh, uh, I'm agreeing with uh, Seth. Uh, his, he said uh, earlier that uh, at the end we might see a process like in the U.S. or in Israel that uh, you have only a few uh, systems, but a very good one. So you will uh, throw away the, the the props for the parade, and uh, you will stick with uh, let's say five to six uh, very good systems. Okay. Now, that's interesting that they're overlapping because of their internal competition, which is something that seems to characterize a lot of the Iranian defense establishment and not just uh, UAV uh, uh, development. Another thing, Tal, that I wanted to ask you about, um, and, you, and you can tell me whether this is uh, realistic or not. Um, do you think it's possible that um, countries that are interested in building serious defenses, can they develop UAVs that will take on UAVs? In other words, if fighter jets, um, as you said earlier, will be overwhelmed with other missions during war and air defenses will be uh, overwhelmed uh, by crowded skies, is it realistic to think that um, you know a country like Israel could develop UAVs whose job mm. will be to take on uh, enemy UAVs? Well, I cannot... Uh respond directly about uh, what Israel is uh, doing or thinking, but uh, generally speaking, uh, you can use um, a UAV with long endurance, let's, let's say 24 hours to 48 hours, uh, equipped it with several uh, air to air missiles, uh, for example, and just uh, send it to, to loiter over your own uh, territory. It could be used as uh, one, uh, one uh, uh, part of the aerial defense. And uh, you can use it, uh, by the way, not, uh, not just against uh, incoming UAVs. And we saw, for example, in several uh, Iranian uh, uh, 
uh, footage from uh, from the news uh, years ago that uh, they uh, are speaking about counter drone drone which will uh, right. loiter over iran so this concept is of course uh, it could be put in use in every country that possesses even uh, not so sophisticated capabilities of uh, of uh, of drones and air to air missiles uh, and it could be very efficient uh, again it's a question that the drone is just a one part of a system and uh, you have to uh, uh, use it uh, with uh, sophisticated ground equipment and and mm -hmm. uh, and some people uh, inside the, the system uh, and in the future not so far future you can incorporate a lot of uh, ai into this uh, kind of uh, operation all right thank you for that and uh, we've got a lot of questions uh, from the audience so i do want to leave a little bit of time for that um let's start with a question from steven who he's asking uh, for the panel to comment on the U.S.'s decision to remove uh, its Patriot missile uh, batteries from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Um, I think I will uh, send that question uh, to you, Seth, first. Um, what do you make of that decision and what is its significance? Well, I mean, let, let's let's take it at face value. If Is that true? If, if, it's, if that's the case and there is a, a drawdown or repositioning of the Patriots, is that because the United States needs them somewhere else, or is it some sort of message to pressure the Saudis uh, to, you know, cut down on their offensive operations in Yemen or, you know, part of some other game plan by the United States? I mean, we know there's some tensions between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia. Um, look, uh, Patriots is an important system, and Patriots can be used against drones and against missiles. Uh, Saudi Arabia is a very wealthy country, but Saudi Arabia needs to, I think, invest a lot more in counter UAS or counter drone defenses because we saw in Abqaiq uh, in the attack that the, they had air defenses and, and, and they had radar and apparently they were, they did not detect it. So that's a big, you know, that seems like a big failure. So mm -hmm. they've gotten better in the last, let's say, years. I think the evidence shows that they do seem to be defending quite well against drones and missiles. Um, yeah, look, at the end of the day, the, the Saudis can't rely on the Americans for everything, just like, you know, the Israel can't, Israel had patriots here in the Gulf War, but in the end of the day, what spurred right. Israel to make real air defenses and real advances in technology like Iron Dome and all these programs is, you know, Israel developing its own technology and a whole, mm -hmm. whole menagerie of systems as well. So, you know, Saudi Arabia is, is building lots of different things, apparently, according to reports, ballistic missiles and all sorts of stuff. So they need to build their own air defenses. And um, and I guess they they ought to be heading in that direction because the Patriot system is not a sinkhole non in terms of drone threats. The drone threats can be very, as we heard, they can be big drones, small drones, swarms of drones. You can't just rely on one type of uh, air defense battery. So you know, insofar as the Americans want to pressure the Saudis or the Americans need the need patriots out in the Pacific, this is the way the world's going. You know, the United States says it's going to be withdrawing from the Middle East a bit. It's concentrating on China and Russia. Countries in the Middle East are all waking up. And if they haven't, they better be. They need to invest in all of their own programs, just like the Iranians have. Right. And, you know, what you say also makes me uh, remember that actually when we look at the number of interceptions that the Saudis have been making over the past two, three years, they're probably the most active air defenders, at, at least in the Middle East and, and maybe the world um, in terms of real world interception. Um, they are, you know, definitely up there with Israel in terms of numbers of interceptions. It's, it's remarkable how many they're making. It also leads me to wonder whether Gulf states in general can benefit from Israeli technology. But I'll, t I'll, I'll take um, another question here. Uh, we have a question from Clifford. Um, and he's saying that many commentators have said that 500 or somewhat more uh, precision guided missiles in Hezbollah's hands is a red line for Israel. I understand uh, that the speed of missiles relative to UAVs creates an advantage. However, uh, Clifford says, given the capability of UAVs to maneuver travel long distances and the newer ones to carry larger payloads that can be delivered very accurately, how does that play into the calculus of a red line that will or would require, uh, theoretically, Israel to react? And I will uh, send that question over to you, Sarit. Um, look, Israeli leadership learned that defining red lines uh, is uh, not a good idea. 
because you don't always know what's your red lines when you start the wars and then you decide that you have actually other red lines and this is a very flexible issue. So I think that also in this, this respect of the drones and the UAVs, I don't see Israel drawing a specific red line in that. And again, especially with regard to the fact that uh, there are many ways to stop that uh, technology, which is not exactly all out war. And I think this is the main thing that we have learned uh, in the past decade with what is happening in the Middle East, by the way, in many issues, that uh, the campaign between the war can uh, create a situation of um, relatively calmness on our borders without ending up in an all-out war and maybe with postponing the all-out war as far as possible. I don't see an Israeli prime minister going to war uh, for mm -hmm. UAVs. Uh, maybe with the rockets and even with that, I'm not sure. Uh, you need a lot of support from the Israelis. And of course, you need also a lot of support from international community. And in both aspects, it's going to be very difficult to justify that. Right. We have a question uh, from Sharon, and I think um, Tal uh, is in a very good uh, uh, position to answer. And Sharon is asking, what is the future of AI integration into drone systems? Um, we can't get to all of Sharon's questions because of time limitations, but let's focus on that one. Um, where is this going, artificial intelligence and, and drone systems, in your view, Tal? Well, the AI systems in, in drones, uh, if, at, at the end, uh, will uh, ease some of the uh, of the stresses and loads from the operators on the ground, so the drone could uh, get its own uh, decision-making process, uh, either to uh, intercept the uh, incoming drone or to uh, attack several targets uh, uh, with pre-designated uh, um, characteristics. Uh, I know that uh, there is a hot debate about uh, the term uh, which I'm not agreed to, uh, killer drones, that uh, a drone will uh, will get the decision to, to kill someone on, on the ground. But uh, actually, if, uh, for example, you will define, the, let's say, a mobile uh, rocket launcher as a target, and it, it could pop up uh, sometime, so a drone could, uh, could hit it uh, without uh, uh, a man in the loop. Uh, I don't see it uh, coming uh, tomorrow, but uh, at the end, uh, I think it's uh, it's a logical step uh, forward. And and Tal, uh, on the same issue of future capabilities and, and possibly current ones, we have a question from Juan, and he's saying, uh, what do you think about uh, defenses against uh, a non-GPS dependent uh, UAVs? Uh, he's talking about those with a range of 100 kilometers or less, but uh, I suppose, you know, the general topic of, of drones, uh, UAVs that are not dependent on satellite communication, sure. do those pose their own kind of special threat? Yeah, yeah, but the issue, the main issue is detection. If you can uh, detect such a such an incoming threat, uh, then you can intercept it uh, either by laser, by, by air to ground uh, missile uh, and so on, or even uh, a collision with a small drone uh, against it. So. Um, it's not a magic uh, solution that a drone could uh, use GPS or could use uh, other systems. Uh, and uh, even if you cannot uh, jam its communication because there is no communication, it's uh, uh, using, let's say, INS. Uh, so uh, you can, if, if you detect it, you can kill it. Right. Okay. Unfortunately, we're out of time. So first of all, I'd like to thank the members of our distinguished panel uh, for this fascinating discussion. Um, I think that we've covered a, a critical topic uh, that deserves lots of attention uh, regionally, internationally. Um, so thank you uh, to all three of you, first of all, for sharing your very important insights with us. Um, I'd like to remind uh, our viewers that um, they're, they can donate to Alma, go onto its website and, and find the link to do that. Um, it, this is a good time to uh, remind everybody that Alma has a range of educational programs touching on Northern Israel and the challenges that this region faces. Uh, the full program is on the ALMA website, um, and the, these educational programs can be transmitted physically or digitally. ALMA uh, is not going to be stopped by COVID uh, from educating audiences around the world, and it's got the uh, capabilities to uh, do so online as well. Um, and if you'd like more information, you're welcome to send an email uh, to ALMA uh, for that information. Um, I'm Yaakov Lapin. I'm live from Rehobot in Central Israel. Thank you very much to all of our panelists for this valuable discussion. 
And I'd like to uh, wish uh, all of our viewers who are celebrating the special holiday of Christmas a Merry Christmas, uh, Shalom, and thank you from here in Israel. Thank you.